Across all these many time zones from the Hawaiian and Tahitian Islands, we can kind of form a sweet metal picture. Straight over a flyover country to the Caribbean and the U.S. Virgin Islands, south into South America, north to the pole, and worldwide on the internet. This is Coast to Coast AM. I'm Art Bell. It will be an interesting morning, I guarantee. Coming up in a moment, Dr. William Pierce, Ph.D., I guess a retired physicist and author of the Turner Diaries, uh, thought by most to be a sort of a Bible for right-wing radicals. And this is a very interesting man, and we're going to try and find out what we can about him in a moment. All right, uh, let us go to rural West Virginia, which where Dr. Wood Pierce is located. He's the author of the Turner Diaries, which is just now going back into print. The opening segment on 16 Minutes Late was about Dr. Pierce. It was present in more ways than one. Just an absolutely amazing piece. It was done by Mike uh, Wallace. And so I wanted to talk about this. Uh, indeed, it is morning there after 2 o'clock in the morning, so it was nice of you to talk about this out. Um, Dr. Uh, I've got more time than uh, 60 minutes to do a piece. I hope it is solved. It is from there to there. Uh, I think there are a lot of Without a set. Um, I'm not sure it answers the question. Uh, you were trying to figure out how you felt about the Vietnam War. On the one hand, you were uh, astounded, apparently, by the protests, but on the other, uh, you might have been out there in the street yourself. Which is it? Oh, no, I would not have been out in the street demonstrating on behalf of the, on behalf of the, the enemy. What I could not understand at that time was what the proper position of the government should have been. Should it have been to try to uh, fight this war to win, in which case this demonstration on behalf of the enemy's partisans in the streets mm -hmm. simply would not have been tolerated, or should it have been simply to say, hey, we made a big mistake, we're not going to 
sacrifice our health and our blood in our blood. And put it in on balance. On on balance, Doctor, which one uh, uh, do you believe, even with today's perspective, uh, would be true that they should have or uh, that we should have gone all the way? Which which do you think? No, if if it had been my choice to make, I would have stayed out from the beginning. But once in, once committed, once having made a major sacrifice, Mm -hmm. my inclination would have been to go ahead and finish the thing quick. Atomic weapons? If necessary. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, I agree with you. <laughs> I really do. I uh, I was involved, thank you, uh, in Vietnam, briefly, thankfully. And um, I, too, was shocked, um, disgusted at the minutia planning by President Johnson of a war that he wasn't qualified uh, to be pursuing at that level. Uh, A little bit of background uh, for you, but I still don't understand how you get from observing what happened to Turner Diaries. So let me continue. Sure, go ahead. I was also concerned by another movement which was going on simultaneously, and that was the so-called Civil Rights Movement, Mm -hmm. uh, in which uh, we had uh, all sorts of uh, demonstrations uh, going on, uh, which, again, called into question uh, our values, our standards, our, our lifestyle, uh, and I, I really couldn't understand uh, the, the significance of these things. I had to stop and back off, try to figure out, now, what does this mean? Here we've got people claiming that uh, the circulation is okay. Uh, we've got people that are claiming that uh, it's not proper for a group of people to have uh, the self-determination and to have a homogeneous society. We have to mix it all up. We have to mix these different races, mix these different cultures together. What's going to be the implication of this for the future? This is really a, quite a drastic change from the way we have done things in the past. And one of the consequences of looking at what was going on in this, uh, this Vietnam War movement and also in the Civil Rights Movement, was I had to do a lot more reading of history, a lot more thinking about um, the, the significance of these things than I had ever had a chance to do before um, as, a, uh, as a student or as a professor. And I, I began coming to some conclusions, and, uh, and I began writing. My writing was editorial, uh, essays, uh, historical feature articles, uh, analysis of current events. It was all uh, nonfiction. It was all pretty serious stuff. And uh, a friend of mine said to me, uh, this was uh, the late uh, Revelo Oliver, who at that time was a professor of classics at the University of Illinois in Urbana. He said to me, hey, you know, People just don't read this kind of stuff that you're writing these days. People are interested in serious writing. If you want people to listen to what you have to say, if you want them to think about your, the ideas that you believe are important, you've got to put it in the form of recreational reading for them. You, you ought to try writing a novel. He gave me a few examples of novels which had been written in the past which had ideas embedded in them. One of them was uh, Jack Lynch, a turn heel. Another was uh, Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. I thought about this. And the more I thought about it, the more it seemed like it might be a good idea. So eventually I thought I would try it. And I did. I I made up an adventure story. Actually, I made it up as I went along uh, because I was pushing a a newspaper at the time. And uh, I put one chapter in each month's issue, it was a monthly newspaper, I put one chapter in each issue of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. When I started, I didn't know how it was going to finish, but uh, over a three-year period, I wrote the Turner Diaries. And I found that uh, my friend, uh, Professor Oliver, had been correct. I got a much larger response from the public to this uh, fictional series than I had gotten to the serious non-fiction that I had written previously. Well, then you've jumped a question on me because I wanted to understand whether, in fact, from you, the Turner Diaries really was intended to be a real message 
uh, uh, carried in in a somewhat uh, entertaining uh, forum, and you you have just confirmed that that is true. So it, it really is it really is your message in that book. Well, yes, I, I had a, a very definite message in that book. The message, however, is not the details of the plot. Uh, that is, I am not trying to predict when I wrote that book in in uh, 1975 to 1978 the specifics of uh, what would happen in the United States. But I was looking ahead in a very general sort of way um, as to how uh, uh, the trends that I could see at that time might be extrapolated to 20 years later. And one of the things I saw was um, the uh, advent of uh, serious terrorism in the United States. And that is one thing that appears to be beginning to happen. Well, there's no question about it. Oklahoma City was proof of that. And well, not, not just Oklahoma City. The, the World Trade Center bombing, the, uh, the series of bombings by the Unabomber, Yes. And all of this, these, these three episodes have, have happened almost simultaneously if you look at it from a, a, a long-range point of view. And it's unprecedented in American history. Was your book prophetic or educational? Uh, well, it, it's turning out, I think, to be uh, prophetic. Uh, I think that is what has uh, been responsible to a large extent for the, the interest shown by the public in it. A lot of people are very concerned by uh, the breakdown of American society. Mm-hmm. And uh, they, they've heard that, hey, you know, this guy back in the 1970s, he predicted this was going to happen. So they want to run out and get the book and be it for themselves. They want to understand, just as I wanted to understand back in the 70s. What is it that you think you understood, uh, backing up again for a second, about the civil rights movement? What was it all about? Well, what I saw was a... Um, a growing uh, heterogeneity in American society, a, a breakdown of the, of the homogeneity that we had had up to that time, uh, an increasing uh, cosmopolitanism, and accompanying that, uh, a growing alienation, a, a breakdown of the bonds of community, uh, a, a loss of the feeling of identity, of identity that we had felt as a people up until that time. And again, I think that uh, that was on target. That's what we're seeing today. Okay. Code words, a few code words, but um, drawing from the 60 Minutes conclusion, which you seem to sort of grudgingly, you know, uh, confirm, that to get America back or to solve this growing problem as you perceived it, the blacks, Jews, uh, even Hispanics, basically, must go? Well, any society which is to remain healthy, has to maintain a reasonable degree of homogeneity. You have to have a consensus among the people. Uh, You have to have a shared sense of history, a a sense of family, if the society is to hold together, remain healthy, and continue to move forward in a progressive sort of way. We've lost that. One way or another, you have to get it back. Why is a sense of family, or uh, even a sort of a national sense and identity dependent upon uh, a homogenous race? Well, uh, if you don't have uh, homogeneity, that is, if you don't have uh, a shared uh, history, a shared blood, shared values, then you cannot really feel that you have a sense of responsibility to the community around you. You tend to withdraw into yourself, that the society to become atomized. You tend to have excessive individualism, excessive egoism, and at the same time an alienation uh, so that uh, the society as a whole uh, has nothing to hold it together. Well, uh, what, how do you delineate uh, between the values? Uh, in other words, uh, black people mixing with white people, mixing with Hispanics and Asians and so forth and so on. Uh, how are the values so very different uh, because of the skin color. Oh, you know, the values that we have are a product of um, our history and our genes. And that people who made up this country or who made up, let's say, white society in this country uh, had a, at least a reasonably common background. We all came from Europe. Uh, we all went through similar experiences and similar environments over 
tens of thousands of years before we came to this country, conquered it, settled it, and began building a new civilization here. Uh, are we, by nature, a warrior people? I think uh, that uh, it's reasonable to say that uh, we are, that uh, we have uh, always fought for the things that we believe were worth fighting for in the past. Uh, uh, it was seldom that we uh, believed that it was proper just to uh, roll over and play dead when uh, we were attacked uh, by people who wanted to take away from us our land or make us change our way of life or deprive us of our freedom. Uh, how do you suppose the American Native uh, perceived our arrival? Well, I guess that uh, different tribes uh, perceived us in different ways, but uh, the... Uh, that uh, certainly many of them must have uh, looked upon us as invaders, uh, as a threat to their way of life. Mm -hmm. As we were indeed. As we were indeed. Mm -hmm. uh, do do we carry any genetic guilt for that, Doctor? Oh, I don't uh, believe that we do. You know, the, the course of world history uh, has been the one of uh, conflict uh, between uh, the peoples, between races, with uh, the ones who were uh, strong, being able to take territory away from the ones who were weak or were not willing to fight uh, and uh, imposing their genes and their values on the land. Uh, probably not one of your favorite people, uh, Reverend Louis Farrakhan. Well, uh, very interesting, uh, actually, intellectually I interesting individual to me. I would also like to interview him, but you're, I'm sure, familiar with um, the way he feels about the black race in America and the white race in America, in many ways, uh, you are strange intellectual bedfellows, are you not? Oh, that's, that's true to a certain extent. You know, it's an interesting thing. When I had this, um, this uh, Mike Wallace interview coming up for 60 Minutes, I'd never seen Mike Wallace uh, interview people before. I'd heard that he was a tough interviewer. Doctor, he is a tough interviewer. We're at the bottom of the hour, and this is, uh, we'll pick up at exactly this point when we come back. Stand by. My guest is the author of the Turner Diaries, Dr. William Pierce. This is the American CBC Radio Network. <laughs> this is the end of side one. Please leave the cassette exactly. Art Bell is taking calls on the wild card line at 702-727-1295. That's 702-727-1295. First-time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. My guest is Dr. William Pierce, author of The Turner Diaries, and he'll be back in just a moment. Fascinating. All right, back now uh, to Dr. Pierce in uh, West Virginia. Where are you in West Virginia, anyway? Uh, I'm near Hillsboro. Actually, I live on the top of a mountain about uh, four miles uh, northwest uh, of uh, Hillsboro. That's in the east central part of the state. In easily defensible locations? <laughs> <laughs> well, depends upon uh, defensible from whom. Uh, it's a nice location. Uh, it's beautiful. Uh, animals and trees and clear skies. I like it here. All right. Um, I, t I mentioned Louis Sarkon. Uh I've seen him in some good interviews uh, in which he suggested that, in fact, in America, the blacks, the whites, should physically, actually go their separate ways. In his case, he would like, he has suggested some strip of appropriate land uh, to where America's blacks might go. Uh, well, you know, it's a, it's a coincidence that you mention him because in, uh, prior to the in a uh, 60 Minutes interview, I asked a friend in New York to send me a, a, a video of any Wallace interview so that I could familiarize myself with his style. 
And uh, my friend sent me a video of uh, an interview that uh, Wallace had done a couple of months earlier with Louis Farrakhan. And uh, so I, I viewed that interview the, the day before my own interview with mm -hmm. Louis Wallace. Yes. I thought Farrakhan did an admirable job of um, presenting himself uh, in a way that would uh, strengthen his position with uh, his people. I've, I've always admired certain things about uh, Farrakhan. Uh, I'm sure that we would disagree on many things, too. But uh, he is, is one of the black leaders that I have had the, the greatest respect for. Interesting. Uh, no doubt agreement with regard to the Jews. Well, I, I cannot just say uh, what uh, Mr. Farrakhan's views are in detail. I know that he resents very much the uh, much of the, the Jewish effort to uh, tell him what is good for his people. Uh, he believes that uh, that is something that should be left up to uh, to the black people, uh, and that uh, they don't need the Jewish uh, guidance in that regard. Um. Let's jump forward uh, a little bit. Uh, your book was ostensibly a novel about an imaginary foot soldier caught up in a race war in, coincidentally, the 1990s. Is that roughly correct? Yes. Uh, do you think that such a race war is likely, unlikely, probable, um, uh, improbable, uh, you, you, you did say you thought of your book as prophetic. Uh, are we going to have a race war? Well, I, I believe we have a, a race war going on at a low level right now. This, uh, the, the crime situation uh, in this country has been, to uh, a growing extent, uh, a war of uh, the, the black underclass against uh, the white majority. Uh, and uh, I see this situation is continuing to get worse. Now I don't believe that in the 1990s we will see um, uh, we will see an open uh, shooting, organized shooting war between the blacks and whites. And I don't know in detail how this conflict will develop in the future. All I could see back in the in the 1970s was that this conflict would grow, that it would intensify, and in fact, I believe it has. If you look uh, at the science of genetics, it, or is it not true that racial mixture uh, produces a stronger uh, genetic component? Now, one cannot, one cannot make a blanket a statement like that. Uh, you have to have a certain uh, degree of uh, homogeneity in order to have uh, be able to say that this is strain A and this is strain B and compare them in yeah. all. Yes, but I, I, really wasn't, certain, I really wasn't asking that. I was I asking... Know, that. Now you need a certain amount of genetic variability yes. uh, in a population if that population is to be able to respond to changes in the environment. That's but we right. have gone far beyond that uh, with the, the uh, things that are happening today. Uh, when we were living in Europe, we always had uh, quite a sufficient degree of genetic uh, variability to uh, take advantage of a fairly wide range of circumstances. There is a, an optimum degree of uh, genetic variability for a population. We are going far beyond that optimum value now. Hmm. Um, so, the, uh, uh, in going far beyond it, we then in your opinion, weaken the genetic strain instead of uh, strengthening it? Yeah, well, we, we threaten it with annihilation. Um, there is currently uh, in the news uh, the story of the Freeman in Montana. Are you keeping yes, up on that? Yes, I've been following that with some interest. Yes, mm -hmm. uh, so have we. Been a hot subject here on the radio lately. Uh, what is your view of their situation? How do you view the, the Freeman? Well, and I don't know if this folks up there in Montana, either individually or as a group. Uh, from what I have seen, we have some uh, pretty wacky religious ideas and some even wackier economic ideas. They believe that a certain uh, amendment uh, to the Constitution wasn't properly ratified, and therefore the Federal Reserve System is illegal, and therefore they are entitled to put their own money. Uh, or something to that effect. That's about right. Yes. Now, uh, I think that is 
is a, a misreading of uh, the history and the law, but at the same time, I sympathize with these folks up there. I think the government has become far too intrusive into our lives. I think the government has become far too oppressive. And these people want to withdraw. They say, hey, we're not going to put up with this crap anymore. We're going to do our own thing. We're going to put our own money. We're going to teach our own kids. We're not going to send them to the public school anymore. We're not going to have any more interaction with the federal government. Now, that may not be practical, but that I do sympathize with that view. I think that the government really ought to try harder to stay out of people's lives, to quit uh, insisting that everyone do things their way. Uh, is there any way that you can see a justification uh, for their, in effect, constructing their own monetary system, uh, uh, issuing uh, liens upon which they wrote checks which were no good and blah, blah, blah? Well, is, is, is there any way you can see that uh, truly justified by their complaint regarding the Fed? Yes, you know, as long as they do this among themselves, of course, uh, more power to them. I think that uh, the unfortunate thing is that uh, they were able to uh, get some other folks uh, involved in this thing by sending their, their checks out to uh, buy things that they wanted, like new tractors and so on. Mm -hmm. They really shouldn't have done that. They should have thought this thing through a little more carefully because that uh, brought the federal uh, government into it. Yes, but I, I, I do sympathize with their basic position of just wanting to be left alone, of feeling that the government was pushing them too hard, even before it. They, uh, they did these things which uh, the government decided uh, it had to step in and, and deal with forcefully. Well, if we are to maintain any form or level of civilization, uh, then there has to be some rule of law. I mean, their, their mortgages uh, could not be paid, uh, so they simply stopped paying them. Uh, and so forth and so on, and the checks and the death threats issued uh, with regard to local officials. Now, should the FBI or should a government uh, or a law enforcement uh, a group be doing essentially what's being done right now, and that is trying to bring them to justice? Uh, you know, if, uh, if I go out and, and uh, take money away from my neighbor, uh, who is not part of my, my thing, so to speak, then I expect the government to, uh, to step in and say, hey, you can't do that. That's stealing. You mm -hmm. have to give it back. Uh, one of the things that I've always been careful to do uh, throughout my adult life uh, is never borrow money, never be indebted to a bank, never be in the position of, of uh, having to make payments that I might not be able to make someday. Uh, these folks got themselves uh, into that position where they began seeing the the banks uh, as their enemies, just taking advantage of them uh, because they, uh, they were overextended uh, in the loans that they had uh, taken out. Uh, and I understand that uh, the government uh, has to protect the interests of the uh, folks outside the Freeman community as well as the interests of the folks inside the Freeman community. All right, well, then having said that, uh, we are extensively, we cover the whole state of Montana like a blanket. They've got radios. You are probably somebody they would listen to. The FBI has surrounded them, 100 FBI out there, they're getting ready to turn off the power. This whole thing is headed south. Bill Bright's has been there. State, State Senator Duke uh, has been there. Um, both of them threw up their hands and said, these people are not the Patriot Movement. These people are not uh, the people you want to be supporting, and we can't do anything with them. They don't keep any agreements, and they walk away. So they're listening to you, no doubt. Tonight, what advice would you give them with the FBI all around them, and no doubt uh, some sort of violent uh, resolution or dynamic entry, possible or probable? Well, you know, as I said before, I don't know any of these folks up there personally. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know much about their organization except what I've seen on the news, and I hesitate a little bit to give advice because I don't really know what all of their considerations are. Uh, if I were into this thing as deeply as they are, with uh, you know facing uh, the prospect of, of many years in prison, um, I might be inclined just to, to stick in there and, and fight it out. I'd, I'd say, what, the, what have I got to lose? If I could go back, however, and start over again, I'd say, hey, I did this the wrong way. I think that it's possible to withdraw, to get the government out of my hair to a certain extent to keep my kids out of the public schools without getting entangled uh, with the FBI the way these freemen
government has. And if the government could offer them some sort of a, uh, a deal where they could make restitution uh, for uh, some of the, uh, the economic uh, irregularities that they are alleged to have been engaged in, mm-hmm. that didn't have to go to jail. I think maybe I would, would look at a deal like that long and hard and say, hey, I didn't, didn't really start this off the way I should have. If I can get out of this uh, without uh, having to spend the rest of my life in jail, maybe I'll try to do that and then uh, go my own way a little bit more prudently in the future. But short of a deal of that magnitude, you'd probably, in their position, fight it out. If, if I were faced with spending the rest of my life in jail, I think I'd shoot it out. Um, why, why is your book, uh, in its um, a present reincarnation, uh, being published by a Jewish man? Well, uh, I can't uh, speak for Mr. Stewart. I can only assume... No, but you have spoken with him. Yes, I have uh, spoken with him. Uh, Mr. Stewart has always been a bit of a renegade uh, in the publishing industry in New York. Uh, his public service uh, would touch... Uh, he's a ballsy sort of a guy. Um, when, my, when I first made the contact with him, he had phoned one of uh, my people who uh, is in charge of uh, book promotion and said he was interested in publishing the Turner Diaries. And so I called Stuart, and uh, he was uh, in a meeting at the time, but when I gave my name, his secretary put me through, and uh, he said, you know, we're, we're talking about your book right now. And, and uh, he told the other folks in the room to say hello, and I heard this chorus of hi in the background. Mm-hmm. He said, you know, you give me a call back at my home tomorrow morning and uh, we can talk about it. But right now I've got to, you know, decide this matter with my own people. So I called him back the next morning and he said, you know, every one of my people yesterday was dead sent against our publishing your book. And that convinced me that we just had to do it. <laughs> you know, he's that sort of a guy. He, uh, he believes in going his own way, and he thrives on controversy. Mm-hmm. And he saw the Turner Diaries as a very controversial book, oh, yes. and I guess he thought that that would uh, go a long way towards selling it. I guess he also thought that any book that is as controversial as the Turner Diaries uh, must have something uh, interesting to say, otherwise it, it would never have all the controversy around it that, uh, that it does. Do you want the future in the Turner Diaries to come true? Well, you know, I hope that uh, we uh, don't have to go through uh, all of the, uh, the, the bloodshed and the unpleasantness that I uh, imagined back in the 1970s when I was writing the book. I would hope that we can wake up and uh, try to choose a more prudent course before we uh, get involved in this, this all-out warfare that I imagined. But uh, if I look at history... I don't see a lot of grounds for hope. It seems like we have very seldom um, w- waken up to, to, the, to the, the, you know, and chosen a more prudent course. It looks like we've, we've generally done things the hard way. We've generally done things the bloody way. And I, um, I don't have a lot of hope that, um, that we won't uh, end up uh, going through a great deal of unpleasantness in the future. Would you consider more likely a race war or a civil war, that is a war against waged against the government, uh, or would they be concurrent? Well, I think uh, probably a concurrent situation. I think probably it will be more of a civil war, but I think there will be a, a, a large racial uh, uh, aspect to that civil war. Component, yes. Yes. Um, now, again, I'm asking you... Would you, in other words, your personal preference, uh, would you see this as inevitable or even something that you would want to happen? Want well, to happen? I've always been a peaceful man. I've, I've been, uh, been sort of a scholar, a, a tinkerer, uh, a nature lover. I've, I've never really been a warrior. I went to, to military school when I was, uh, was a teenager. But uh, aside from that, I've, uh, I've not been a, a, a warlike uh, a person. I've never been a violent person. Uh, I, uh, I would like to see a peaceful resolution to our problems. I just don't happen to believe that we will have a peaceful resolution. But 
while you suggest that about yourself, um, you're saying you will not practice what you, in essence, preach, that we must become, oh, hold on a second. That we must become participants in, in change. The, the Turner Diaries is not a book of advocacy. It's not a book which says, this is the way the future should be. It's a book which says, this is the way the future will be. Okay. But you seem to embrace the concepts and ideas personally that would drive this uh, scenario in your book to be reality. No, I don't. Th I mean, I, the, the, the specific plot in the book, which involved uh, nuclear weapons and, uh, and a lot of other you know, lots of uh, mm -hmm. violent things. Uh, that's not uh, something that uh, that I uh, look forward to with uh, with eagerness. Uh, that's not the sort of thing that I relish. Those are not the ideas in the book. Uh, that is simply the plot of the book. And I tried to make the plot uh, interesting. I tried to make a, a gripping adventure story so that uh, people wouldn't put the book down uh, after the first few pages and say, hold on, I've got better things to do. I wanted them to read the whole thing through, so I tried to make a a believable uh, adventure scenario. Uh, I tried to put myself in the in the skin of the protagonist, uh, Earl Turner, as I was writing, and uh, and to make it exciting. You know, this was one chapter a month, and so something exciting had to happen in every chapter to to uh, to keep the, up the interest. All right, are you? Um pleased by or um, not pleased by the fact that apparently Timothy McVeigh, the uh, man accused of blowing up the uh, Murrah building in Oklahoma City, no, apparently embraced your book and your story uh, almost as uh, uh, specific instructions. No, no I, you, you're sort of implying that my book was the inspiration for the bombing in Oklahoma City, and I don't believe that's true at all. I think the inspiration for the bombing in Oklahoma City was the massacre in Waco, Texas that took place two years earlier. And uh, you might ask uh, Bill Clinton and Janet Reno whether they're pleased that uh, what they did uh, in Waco in killing all those women and children uh, has uh, inspired uh, Timothy McVeigh and others to... Uh, to blow up uh, the federal building in Oklahoma City. That may have certainly been the cause uh, within Mr. McVeigh's mind, but the methodology is just about exactly that described in your, in your book. Uh, well, you know, as I said, I, I tried to be realistic. Doctor, we'll pick up on, on this note. We're at the top of the hour here, so just relax, and we'll be back. Uh, my guest is Dr. William Pierce. His book, Reincarnating on the Bookshelves, The Turner Diaries.
a weapon of choice uh, for the terrorist who wants to uh, blow up a building. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a truck bomb that was used to blow up the Marine barracks uh, in Lebanon. When was that? 1984? Uh, it was uh, a truck bomb which was used to blow up the, uh, the World Trade Center. Oh, yes. uh, and uh, Timothy McVeigh, uh, who um, I understand was a student of military science, uh, must have been aware uh, of this, uh, that it's, it's the weapon which uh, has been used traditionally, and it's the weapon which, uh, which makes sense mm -hmm. uh, if you want to uh, do large-scale damage to uh, uh, a, a strong structure like a concrete building. No question about it. Uh, but uh, he is also known to have been, in fact, a student of yours. So uh, combined with the chapter in the book and the fact that he uh, regarded it almost as a Bible, I mean, it, it makes a connection almost impossible to, to uh, deny. Well, you know, I, I don't know what you think. Suppose uh, uh, a, a criminal uh, goes out and, and hangs someone Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you say, well, look, we found a copy of this Western novel uh, with him, and uh, in this uh, book uh, there's a hanging, and they used a rope. They used a rope in this hanging. Yes. And this criminal also used a rope. He must have gotten the idea from reading this Western. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's stretching it. The fact is that uh, if you want to hang somebody, you use a rope. If you want to blow up a, a, a building, you use a truck bomb with, uh, with fertilizer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I recall doing an interview uh, on the radio. Another radio station was interviewing me, and I, I began to see the pictures of Oklahoma City. And that moment is sort of ingrained in my memory, the way so many others are throughout our history, the Kennedy assassination and so forth. And that moment, when you began to see what was going on in Oklahoma, uh, did it flash through your mind? What flashed through my mind? Your book, that explosion. I mean, didn't at that moment when you began seeing the news coverage, what were your thoughts? Well, you know, it, it took a while for me to uh, understand what had happened there, as I think uh, was the case with with uh, most other people. Uh, you know, I, I, I watched a lot of that that early uh, news reel coverage of the bombing, and uh, one of the things that struck me uh, was that. Uh, this was within, say, the first hour after the bombing. Mm -hmm. uh, they, they were reporting that other unexploded bombs had been found in the building. I recall that, yes. And uh, so uh, that, was, that was very interesting to me. I was trying to figure out, well, just what has gone on here? Uh, what, what caused this uh, explosion? Other unexploded bombs in the building? That must mean it was an inside job. And then later on, there was, there was never an explanation. Of this, they just stopped talking about these these other bombs that they had found, and this, of course, has fueled all sorts of wild speculation. Uh, there are a lot of people that uh, are speculating that the government uh, blew up the building themselves to mm -hmm. serve as a pretext for cracking down on the militias mm -hmm. and for outlawing fire. I don't believe that. I don't believe the government blew up the building themselves. But I always wondered what what happened to these. Unexploded bombs that they were talking about early in the uh, in the newsreel coverage of this thing. Oh, I don't know. Any large event like that gets conspiracy theories wound into conspiracy theories. Uh, right. I'm, 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 I'm talking about the know. theories. I'm talking about the news reports. Yes, I recall the news reports, uh, and I think there was an explanation that they were there for training, or they were. There. I, I can't exactly recall, but it did sort of drop off. Then there were people who said that well, there were two explosions, not one, and they attempted to produce um, seismic uh, uh, records that indicated that was so, and, you know, and on and on, and then, of course, John Doe number two, uh, we could go on and on about the, uh, the, the, the sort of urban myths, uh, maybe some of them not myths, that have grown out of this. Right. Well, I, you know, as I said, I was following all this, and it was a while before um, the conclusion uh, was reached mm -hmm. uh, by the authorities and based on their investigation that, uh, in fact, this had been a truck bomb uh, using uh, ammonium nitrate fertilizer. Exactly. Uh, so, um, it, uh, you know, it took me a while to, to uh, understand what had happened, too. I, I don't well, think so, so, so the conclusion. It came slowly. Uh, but at some point, you, you must have begun to see uh, the fact that there was a connection or that people would perceive there was a connection, one of the two. No, not, not really. You know, it was quite a while later. Uh, before there were reports that, um, uh, what's his name, Mike Day, 
had uh, read the uh, the Turner Diaries that he had talked about mm-hmm. it to some of his uh, army buddies. Uh, you know, I watched the news reports of the uh, World Trade Center bombing uh, too, and uh, it came out, I think, a little bit more clearly and a little uh, earlier in that bombing than it was a truck bomb uh, that was used uh, in the uh, in the World Trade Center bombing. Now, people don't ask me, say, well, don't you feel responsible for the World Trade Center bombing? I mean, after all, it was a bomb similar to the one you described in the, in the Turner Diaries. And I say nonsense. It's clear, again, that the, the motivation for that bombing was not something that the folks who blew up the World Trade Center had read in a book. It was what our government has actually been doing over in the Middle East. And these folks wanted to send a message to the government, say, hey, we don't appreciate the fact that you're supporting Israel and Israel is killing our people. Uh, and I think, again, in the case of the Oklahoma City bombing, it was somebody who wanted to send a message to the government about something that the government had actually done, namely the massacre in Waco. It wasn't an inspiration that came from reading a book, my book, or anybody else's book. All right, and I got a government sentiment. Uh, is building uh, along with other hatreds um, very rapidly in America right now. Is it your prophetic sense that we're going to see a lot more Oklahomas? Well, uh, I don't know uh, how things will go in detail, but in general, yes, I do believe that we will see more uh, terrorism. I believe that the scale will increase. I believe that the number of incidents will increase. Mm -hmm. I believe, in other words, that these incidents that we have seen happening almost simultaneously uh, on a historical scale, the World Trade Center bombing, the the, um, Oklahoma City bombing, the the Unabomber and and his uh, mail bombs, uh, I think that uh, uh, this uh, is just the beginning. I would imagine that you have read in total the uh, Unabomber's manifesto. Yes, I did read that when it was uh, published uh, in the uh, Washington Post and the New York Times. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the the method of getting it published aside for a moment, even his deeds for a moment, uh, what are your impressions of the manifesto? Well, you know, I, um, I don't agree with a lot of the ideas that uh, Mr. Kaczynski uh, expressed uh, in his uh, manifesto. Uh, he came from a, uh, a left-wing uh, background. Uh, I, I don't share a lot of those uh, those sentiments that are common in the left wing, but I do sympathize with some of the things that apparently were were bugging him when he wrote that manifesto. Specifically, he, excuse me. Specifically, well, an example. Yeah, he he has complained about what. Um, this this over industrialized uh, life style has has done to us as a people what it's done to the world. Mm-hmm. And uh, when I was studying history, I was struck by the the changes that the industrial revolution made in the in the life and in the the thinking of uh, people. Uh, it uh, it took people off the farms, out of the countryside away from the villages, uh, and urbanized them. It packed them together into factory towns, into mill towns. Uh, and I think that, by and large, this was an unhealthy change. Now, I'm not a, a Luddite like Mr. Uh, Kaczynski. Uh, I'm a bit of a technology freak myself. I've always been interested in computers and, and other devices. But I do think that the way in which technology has been applied to our lives uh, has not been well thought out, uh, that it has had some very unfortunate uh, consequences. And I I could see Mr. Kaczynski uh, agonizing over these things in his manifesto, and I I sympathize with with a lot of what he said. Mm -hmm. What about his method? You mean of sending out mail bombs to uh, the various uh, people? Yeah, now, I, no, I, I, don't, I really don't agree with that at all. I, 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 often I wondered uh, why he chose some particular guy as a, as a target when uh, I couldn't really see that this guy was responsible for the things that Mr. Kaczynski was complaining about. And I got the impression that maybe Mr. Kaczynski was acting more out of frustration, out of the feeling that, that he just had to do something 
um, and uh, hadn't really uh, worked out a an effective plan of action to uh, change the things that he found disagreeable. Mr. Kaczynski said that the reason I killed was because had I not, would you have published me? Would you have listened to me? The answer is no. So he claims he did what he did so that what he had to say would be heard. Well, may maybe so, or maybe this was just a rationalization uh, uh, after the fact. Uh, I don't know. Uh, that is, nevertheless, uh, uh, what he claimed. And is that not, in, in a lot of ways, very similar uh, to what your character did to the FBI building in Washington for very much the same reason? No, not, not so. Um, the uh, bombing of the FBI building was uh, for a very specific purpose. It wasn't to send a message to the government. It was to destroy a computerized identity card system that the government was developing so it could keep track of all of its uh, citizens. Well, that's a message. Excuse me? That's a message. Well, the, uh, the, the, the folks uh, who uh, were uh, uh, fighting against the government uh, in the Turner Diaries were concerned about a specific threat. Uh, and that was this this uh, computerized identity card system that the yes. government was developing, yes. and the computers were in the basement of the uh, FBI headquarters, and so that's why they put the bomb there. Actually, uh, almost a Unabomber kind of message, really. Well, I guess it depends upon uh, how you uh, look at it. Uh, I I think that uh, the Unabomber was not trying to stop any particular program or something, I think maybe he was just trying to say, hey, I'm here, I've got some real concerns, listen to me, uh, but uh, I don't think that he hoped to uh, stop some of these uh, industrial programs he saw as, as uh, life-threatening uh, by uh, killing some forestry mm -hmm. official or some professor at a university or, or what have you. All right, Timothy McVeigh, for a second aside, uh, how do you feel about the fact um, that your book has been embraced as sort of a, a Bible of the extreme right. Um, is that upsetting to you, pleasing to you? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I, I don't know that I have... Um, I don't know that I'm upset uh, by this uh, claim or, uh, or that I'm pleased by this claim. I'm not sure that the claim is true. Uh, you know, what you call the, uh, the extreme right is a pretty... Um, a uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, bunch of people. Uh, there are a lot of different types of folks. There, there are these identity Christians. I, I understand that. Um, that's what these people uh, up in Montana are, the Montana Freemen. Uh, there are people with other ideas. Uh, and uh, I doubt that um, the, the, all of the people who are opposed to the government for one reason or another I agree that uh, the Turner Diaries uh, is, is a viable for them. I think maybe a, a lot of people who are opposed to the government find certain ideas of interest mm -hmm. in the Turner Diaries, but I don't think that as a whole they would, uh, they would accept it as a viable. Are you a religious man? I, I am uh, a religious person. I'm, uh, I guess, what you would call a nature worshiper. Uh, do you th uh, do you believe in a creator? Yes, I do. But I see uh, the creator not as some big daddy up in the sky, sitting on the clouds and and uh, keeping his uh, finger on everything going on below. Mm -hmm. uh, I see God as uh, imminent in nature, uh, an indwelling God. Do you believe man has a soul? Depends upon how you uh, define soul. As I really something, to... something. I'll, I'll do it for you. Something that would live beyond. Uh, the physical uh, or exist beyond the, uh, the the physical. No, no, I, I, don't, I don't believe in ghosts. I, I don't believe that I or anybody else um, continues to uh, to be conscious uh, and to be able to uh, to think about things and observe what's going on after his body has been destroyed. So no heaven, no hell. No heaven, no hell. Okay. Um, do you think that that which you describe? You, you, you said you believe in God, then you said, well, God is kind of nature, uh, or maybe nature. Uh, do you think that nature or God looks upon white people uh, in, a, in a more kindly way than it does those of other skin colors? And well, you're, you're making uh, God anthropomorphic. I am, yeah. Uh, here. And I don't 
um, I don't look at it that way uh, at all. Um, I am a person of European ancestry, mm -hmm. and I value more the things that my people have done. I, I value things like Western civilization and the, the values uh, that um, uh, are at the root of Western civilization. Uh, I value uh, the history of my own people. I value the the great men of my own people more than I do uh, the values and the people and the history associated with uh, other racial groups. Uh, okay, well, I, but I can't I can't speak for God. Wouldn't it be these very men that you describe that you admire, the values you admire, uh, who would bring about a system of identification that you would? blown up? Do you, uh, wouldn't I, it be, I guess I didn't follow your well, question. Uh, yes, okay. Uh, you, I in your book, you said uh, the FBI building was blown up because of this new system of identification. If there were to be such a thing, and many believe that we are headed in that direction, would it not be instituted b by the very people you suggest you admire? No, I don't think so. I, I think that uh, we're headed toward a a national identity card system mm -hmm. because the government is worried about losing its grip on things. Uh, we're seeing a, a series of actions and reactions. The government uh, becomes a bit more intrusive, a bit more Im oppressive, and, uh, and people react to that becoming hostile to the government. And the government says, uh-oh, the natives are getting restless. We've got to do something about this. Let's have a, an identity card system so we'll know where people are all the time. Uh, and then uh, people uh, learn about this, and that makes them even more alienated from the government, more likely to commit uh, terrorist acts. And then the government, in turn, re reacts to this. And so you have an escalating um, uh, series of, of uh, things which I think will lead to more violence and more hostility. And you think it's not going to be very long, correct? I don't want to try to uh, predict um, with any degree of precision how long, but I, I would say within a decade we will see a significant escalation. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll pause at that, that note. We'll be right back to you, Doctor. This is CBC. <laughs> This is the end of side one. Art Bell is taking calls on the wild card line at 702 727 1295. That's 702. 727-1295. First time callers can reach Art Bell at 702-727-1222. 702-727-1222. Now, here again, Art Bell. Once again, here I am. My guest is Dr. William Pierce, author of the very controversial Turner Diaries. Coming back now in print once again. Back now to Dr. William Pierce. Uh, he was a physics uh, professor, very interesting, a physics professor, and then uh, I guess retired and became an author. And um, many people say his book um, forwards the idea of hatred, in fact, culminating in a race war. It is a fictional work about a race war. Uh, with a message, and we discussed that, and I think it's an important uh, important aspect uh, that you really did want the message out, Doctor. Now, I think, arguably, whether it's racial hatred or it's the hatred of the government, it is certainly these days increasing, and it's headed toward something. Now, one side preaches we must end this stupid, wasteful hatred um, between people because of races and differences that we have. The other side, uh, and I think it fairly is your side, uh, sees that as increasing or even wants it to increase. Uh, one way or the other, we want to have some resolution, we'll have some final resolution in our society, a race war or some way to cure this, this hate. Which way is it going? Yeah, let, let me... Um 
Let me interject something here. You talked about the Internet in one of your commercials just a minute ago. That's right. Uh, I've actually got a lot of different um, uh, facets of this message, part, only part of which appeared in the Turner Diary. Mm -hmm. I've got a website on the Internet where people can look at a lot of the other uh, facets of the message. Uh, the website address is www.natvan, that's N-A-P-V-A-N dot com, mm -hmm. www.natvan.com. Okay. Now, you talked about um, uh, hatred. Yes. Uh, and it's true. Uh, we are seeing uh, a lot more uh, hatred, uh, a lot more uh, hostility, a lot more tension uh, building up uh, in this society uh, than, uh, than anybody is, is comfortable with. Uh, and um, people are saying, oh, we've got to stop this hatred. It's, it's a bad thing. And I agree, but I think that the only way that we are going to stop it is to look at the causes of it and try to undo those causes. I think that uh, when we have this conflict developing between the races uh, as a consequence of these programs to force the races together, to force them to mix, we've got to say, hey, maybe this program, uh, this idea that, uh, that everybody will be happy if, uh, if we force them all together, maybe, maybe we were wrong on that. Maybe what we need to do is the sort of thing that uh, Mr. Farrakhan has been advocating. We need to let people do their own thing. We need to allow them to separate if they want to, and then perhaps we can decrease some of this hostility. In your book, uh, there is a very provocative chapter um, about the day of the rope. The day of the rope. This is when um, all race traders, main, uh, traders mainly white, white people would be hung from lampposts and stop signs and such. Yes? Y yes, you know, there was a civil war going on uh, in the uh, book, and uh, the revolutionaries had captured Southern California. But uh, they had not pacified Southern California. There, there was all sorts of uh, turmoil going on. There was uh, sniping and assassination and sabotage. Uh, and so the... Um, sort of like Southern California today. Yeah, sort of like Southern California today. Uh, and so uh, there was a, um, a pacification program which involved hanging an awful lot of people in order to uh, calm things down, a very unpleasant uh, episode uh, in the book, but one which seems to have uh, stuck in the minds of uh, mm -hmm. most of the readers. Would uh, who, for what offense in the, in that book would one be hung? Well, um, there were uh, people who were hung uh, for having betrayed their race. I remember a specific example uh, of a realtor uh, who was hanged uh, because um, he had uh, participated in a program which uh, provided uh, uh, lower-cost uh, housing to uh, racially mixed couples, uh, for example. Uh, and uh, the revolutionaries have re regarded him as an advocate of this program, which uh, they regarded as racially destructive. And so he was hanged not only as part of the pacification program, but as an example to the rest of the population. Mm -hmm. uh, Doctor, what would you say to a happily married uh, interracial couple? Well, um, you know, I don't know that I have anything uh, to uh, say uh, to uh, such a couple myself. I don't uh, believe that miscegenation is uh, uh, healthy for a society. Uh, I know that it is increasing among us today. I know that we have people who uh, advocate that as uh, a solution to the racial conflict. Are, are, are you certain that it is not? Excuse me? Are you Am cer I certain that it's not a, yes. a solution? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't believe it is. Uh, I mean, I've seen uh, miscegenation uh, increasing over the last uh, three decades, and I've also seen the racial conflict increasing over the last three decades. And you, you attribute it directly to that? Well, no, I don't say that the, the racial conflict uh, is attributable to the miscegenation, but I think we see these things going together. We used to have in America a separate societies, a white society and a black society. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we had a lot 
lower level of racial conflict and a lot less miscegenation. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we also had a lot of uh, a difference between uh, uh, the rights of black people and the rights of white people, didn't we? Well, uh, in terms of voting rights in the South, for example? Uh, one example, sure, or, or, or where one sat on the bus or many other things. Right. Uh, we had a... a, a uh, the white society was clearly dominant uh, in uh, uh, our society since prior to the Second World War. We had uh, separate and unequal societies uh, in this country. Separate I don't think that yes. was a, a healthy uh, situation either. We got ourselves into a pretty uh, unfortunate mess in this country uh, by starting off with a slave-based economy uh, in the South back in colonial days. Uh, when uh, that uh, uh, slavery came to an end during the Civil War, uh, we dumped uh, three million uh, freed slaves uh, into the general population and laid the basis for the problem that we have today. I saw a solution to uh, this problem, thought they could head off uh, a lot of unpleasant consequences by sending the slaves and their descendants back to Africa. And President Lincoln looked with uh, a favor on this program uh, and was uh, helping to formulate a plan for repatriation at the time he was assassinated. Uh, so then, uh, that day, of course, is gone. Uh, we now have what we have. So, ideally then, in this country, would you see it be separate but equal with regard to rights, uh, constitutional uh, bill of rights, all the rest of it? Um, well, I think, I think we need to have separate societies again. Uh, I doubt that those societies will be equal. Uh, they will be different societies. They will have uh, different types of people in them. Well, again, though, I refer to equality with regard to constitutional rights, civil rights. Well, I think we're going to have different constitutions. Uh, people need to have governments and laws and societies, institutions that are reflections of their own nature. And different types of people are going to have different societies, different governments. Well, then, this is asking you to speculate, of course, but... Uh, just out of curiosity, how would you see a separate white nation, or how would you see it delineated from a separate black nation? Uh, yeah, yeah, well, you know, you're, you're asking me a question which I can't just answer off the top of my head. If I were in a position to design a new society, mm -hmm. I would work on that problem. But it, it would be something that I would take a long time to uh, work out. I would think about it very carefully. I would seek the advice of a lot of other people. I can't answer that off the top of my head. In general, I try to avoid hypothetical questions in these interviews because I, I don't like to make snap judgments on anything. Well, I'm, it's just something that I imagined you would have thought of um, since you feel that that is, is the only possible direction that will, or, or, or ultimate direction whether we have a race war or we don't have a race war that will cure this problem. So then you must have occasionally imagined uh, the differences between these um, governments, structures, lands, peoples. Well, no, I mean, I don't try to design the type of uh, government that uh, some other group of people uh, will have. I don't believe that uh, we should uh, impose uh, our ideas about government on other people. I've never agreed with this idea that it was uh, America's uh, mission to uh, make sure that uh, every country in the world uh, had a democratic uh, form of government. Uh, I don't believe uh, that uh, we should have uh, uh, taken upon ourselves the burden of uh, changing the, uh, the religion of uh, the people in Africa or India or anywhere else. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we should concern ourselves uh, with our own problems, our own people, our own development, and uh, let other people uh, have the form of government, the religion, uh, the institutions that uh, they find uh, congenial to them. So then, what might you say to a black man or Hispanic or any other race uh, who would stand before you and say, look, I don't want to be separate. I'm an American. I like where I am now. I like the country that I live in. I don't want to go somewhere else. I don't want to be separated. What do you say to that person? Then we're going to have a conflict. We'll have to fight each other. 
Well, that's too bad, isn't it? Yes, it is too bad. It's too bad that we got ourselves in the position where we have to have this conflict. It's too bad that we did not maintain the degree of separateness that we had at one time in the past. Uh, during the interview with Mike Wallace on Sunday, uh, he asked you about your admiration of Adolf Hitler. So right, let, let me ask you about it as well. Uh, what is it? Uh, that you admire about Adolf Hitler? You know, after the First World War, um, Germany was in, uh, in pretty bad shape, uh, economically, socially. Mm -hmm. um, we had a, um, a... They had a government uh, uh, known as the Weimar Republic, which um, uh, tolerated uh, homosexual behavior, which uh, tolerated uh, all sorts of... Uh, things that um, a certain uh, liberal set found very congenial, but which was uh, very distressing to the more tradition-minded uh, component in the, among the German people. Uh, and Hitler uh, developed policies and programs which restored Germany to health, not only to uh, economic uh, health, not only to uh, political strength, but to uh, moral and spiritual health. Uh, he managed to get all of the German people, or virtually all of them, uh, behind him with this policy, uh, these policies that, uh, that he formulated. He did a job which was uh, nothing short of miraculous. And uh, I'm not the only one who has uh, looked upon these policies with a degree of admiration. Winston Churchill, uh, back prior to the Second World War, uh, expressed his admiration for what uh, Hitler had done in Germany for Hitler's policies and programs. When uh, when it finally got down to it, though, uh, we all know what the final solution uh, was. What about that part of it? Well, you know, one of the things that uh, Hitler uh, and uh, his followers were determined to do in Germany was to free uh, German society from the very disproportionately uh, strong Jewish influence that had built up uh, during the uh, period of the Weimar Republic. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, German uh, newspapers were uh, disproportionately in uh, Jewish hands. Uh, the uh, legal profession was uh, very heavily in uh, Jewish hands. Uh, the uh, Jews had uh, developed a disproportionately strong influence in the uh, universities. Uh, in the arts uh, and uh, Germans. Why, were, why, why uh, before we go on, why, by the way, do you think that occurred? Well, the Jews uh, have, uh, by working together, by having a strong sense of racial solidarity, uh -huh. uh, by cooperating with each other, uh -huh. uh, uh, had a great advantage toward doing that this sort of thing uh, in every country that they have uh, moved into. The very thing you admire, natural selection. <laughs> right. Uh, uh, when it is something that is done by my people to strengthen their own position. But, uh, when not, not, it, not when it's done by anybody else. But not when it's done by somebody else so that it uh, uh, weakens my people and affects my people. Now, hmm. if a group of people in their own part of the world uh, do this, it's not my concern. I don't worry about it. I don't resent it. But uh, the German people did resent the situation that had developed in Germany, and uh, they set about to change that situation. They instituted from uh, 1933, when uh, Hitler became chancellor, they instituted a program to essentially de-Judaize German society. Indeed. Uh, they uh, rooted the Jews out of the teaching profession. That is, Jews could remain in the teaching profession, but they could only teach Jews in Jewish schools. They rooted them out of uh, journalism. Jews could still publish newspapers, but only newspapers for the Jewish community. They rooted them out of entertainment. They rooted them out of uh, German economic life. Uh, and the result of this was that the Jews began to see Germany as a place without a future for them, and they began leaving the country. Uh, there were some 600,000 Jews in Germany in 1933, uh, when uh, Hitler became chancellor, that number had decreased to approximately 200,000 
1939 when the Second World War broke out. Uh, Two-thirds of, uh, of uh, the Jews had physically left Germany, and their influence over German life had uh, virtually been uh, neutralized. And this, uh, Adolf Hitler, of course, went far beyond that when he then, uh, in lands he successively conquered, uh, collected generally the Jews and uh, made a good shot at genocide and killed millions. Well, you know, there's been quite a bit of um, controversy uh, about what actually happened. There were charges immediately after the Second World War, for example, that uh, millions of Jews were gassed to death in Germany. Mm -hmm. And uh, certain prison camps, uh, the, the camp at Dachau, for example, outside Munich, yes. uh, was uh, held up as an example of an extermination camp, and there was a big plaque at the entrance to the camp that so many tens of thousands of Jews had been gassed to death in the gas chamber there. Do you suggest that did not occur? Uh, it did not occur at, at Dachau, and that, that is generally recognized. Now, the plaque has come down, and uh, it is admitted that there never was a gas chamber at that hour in which anyone was gassed. In other camps? Well, in other camps, I don't really know. But uh -huh. as it has developed, uh, you, in order, if you question it, you've got to look at the details. You've got to look at the facts. You can't say, well, there was a Holocaust or there wasn't a Holocaust. You've got to say, what specifically do you allege happened? What, what are all the details which together make up the Holocaust? And if you think that maybe that wasn't entirely true, you've got to look at it detail by detail. Examine the, the specific instances that are alleged to have happened and see whether or not, in fact, they were true. And when okay. you do that... Do you think it was partially true? I think it was partially true, yes. Partially true. Uh, that uh, just as um, the government in this country rounded up uh, as, as citizens of Japanese descent and put them in internment camps or no, but, but not. concentration camps... The same thing happened in Germany and in the German-occupied well, territories during the Second World War. Though so certainly what we did with the Japanese constitutionally was uh, uh, w w was not constitutional, I guess I have to say. Well, uh, we I, did I don't not know that I'll make a constitutional judgment on that or not. I don't think the Supreme Court uh, raised a big fuss about that uh, back during the war. Well, they've, they've certainly redressed it. Uh, Doctor, we're at the top of the hour. Um, you know, I'm going to have to uh, bow out now. I'm becoming a little hoarse, and probably you'll want to um, allow some of the, the callers a chance to call in, and I think I'll let you talk to those callers. All right. And I appreciated the chance to be on your program. Dr. Pierce, thank you.